Hello, and thanks for joining us for another edition of the Irish Angle on Jump To It. Uh, I'm joined as usual with Johnny Ward and Emma Nagel, and we're going to have a look back at all of last week and all the different things that went on. And we're also going to have a, a quick look ahead to next weekend, which is a big weekend for Irish racing with Irish Champions Festival with Leopardstown on Saturday and the Cur on Sunday and some fantastic racing in store. Emma, Johnny, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Thanks, Vincent. Vincent. Now, we start off, we go back a week, back to Bank Holiday Monday last week and down Patrick, all sorts of shenanigans, or it seems to be. It's hard to know what to make of it, to be honest with you. The big thing was a uh, horse called Anyway, trained by Ken Buds, back from 28 to 1 into evens and wins 8.5 lengths in a handicap hurdle. What do you think, Johnny? Was that uh, a shock to you? It certainly was to me, anyway. <laughs> Yeah, like just another manic uh, Monday, Vinny, really. I mean, I've worked at a lot of, um, what shall we say, run-of-the-mill meetings over um, over the last few months. And uh, I've come to the conclusion that the drama happens when you don't expect it. Um, you know, you have small meetings around the country. Um, you get gambles pulled off. You get jockeys winning on comeback rides. You get all sorts of things happening. I was on holidays last week, and uh, there were two meetings on on Monday, and I um, didn't really even look at the cards, to be honest. I was trying to be in holiday mode, and then I got some texts in, pity you're not working at Downpatrick today, and all that. I was like, what's all this about? So then this, the, the whole Charles Burns gamble happened. Um, I remember when Charles pulled off one of the more famous gambles, I suppose. Um, and when you say Charles pulled off, his horses. Um, were well backed in an accumulator and three or four of them won. I can't even remember now, but it was back in Roscommon um, a few years ago. And I think it was a bit of an um, old aid to Barney Curley's gamble in the sense of when Barney Curley started pulling off these multiple gambles, um, I think I think it's fantastic for racing in many respects. People talk about it and start dreaming of the possibilities of the money you can win on multiples and so on and so forth. Um, so when Charles pulled off that gamble in Roscommon, I texted him that morning um, or that afternoon and uh, he replied to the effect that it was probably Bucky's money that he, he hadn't had a bet on himself. Um, so that was that was grand and I've had a horse with Charles before and uh, he the horse wasn't much good and he wouldn't take a penny more than he could off you in the sense that he was very honest, just scared, you know, the horse isn't good enough, move her on and that was grand. So that was my uh, relationship with Charles anyway and um, this happened then and uh, I, I suppose really, there's not so much I can say about this but the, Charles is clearly a marked man because to have a horse that was scratched, the, basically a horse, if you look at Carlos and you look at his profile, if anyone else trained this horse, give or take, looking at him here, he was trained by uh, Ian O'Connor. If anyone else trained this horse, it was a, a trainer switch. His last run was in November. His form was not, 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 not. Um, 100 to 1 or more, all starts. Declared to run in a race on uh, Monday and was scratched. Nothing, just literally nothing to see here. Nothing to see here. So why did the IHRB go to such an effort to look into the scratching of the horse? And then, as all of this has happened, the, the uh, Emma, who's, you know, the, the crucial leg of the trio, takes us into the group, and she figures out that there's actually a connection, and it could be a completely trivial connection between the horse that wins the race and Charles Burns, because Charles Burns actually bought the horse in the past. And I was still on holiday here, and I was looking, what is going on here? Why is why is Emma texting the group about a horse that Charles Burns bought that he doesn't train? Um, the mystery continues. Yeah, well, look, the, the first thing for me, right? Okay, we you, you went around about, because I was going to start off with the Anyway winning, and then we'll move on to Carlos and the withdrawn <laughs> horse. Anyway. But, but, but starting off with Anyway, right? Let, let, let's say you were wherever you were on Monday morning, or Emma, for that matter, either of you, and you happen to get a call from Ken Buds, right? Man who's had one winner so far this year, and he rings you and says, look, I'm sticking cheek pieces on my horse today. I think he's got a great chance. What would you have on him? Would you have a tenner on him? You might. Would you have 15 quid? I don't know. But, like, how does it go from 28 to 1 to evens? Like, if if Ken Bud called up to me house this morning and told me the horse couldn't be beat, I still can't see myself having more than 20 quid on. Like, you know, how does that happen? That's what that's what I find hard to hard to fathom myself. What do you think, Emma? Would you have had your, whatever, remortgage the house or whatever on that horse if Ken Bud's had told you he was going to win? Emma, I mean, Emma, sorry, Emma's a young person in, in Ireland in 2003. She does not have a mortgage. Let's let's be clear about that. <laughs> <laughs> Very right, Johnny. Very right. But, I mean, like, I suppose if you look at the form of the horse, it's not kind of totally out of the realms of questioning that 
it was capable of winning that race in Down Patrick. I mean, it's very kind of unexposed. It only had, I think, two runs in handicaps to date and kind of off a long break, yeah. cheek pieces fitted. Like, it's, I don't think it's, it's kind 42 of... 42 lengths on its last run. Like, it's, you know, I know, it's not I know, exactly but, screaming at you. Yeah. yeah. I, but I, I just don't think, you, you see winners like that. I don't think it's totally, you know, totally out of the blue and kind of, actually, I'm probably a strange thing to say, but... Um, yeah, like it was some confidence behind the horse, obviously, to back it from 20s into even money. I mean, look, I don't know what kind of money that would take. I suppose like to get it down to 10s probably wouldn't take major money, probably each way money here and there. But to get it down to even money then was um, real, real confidence. Like, I'm not sure if I was given the tip, I probably maybe 20 each way, probably be the most I'd put on it, really. Just kind of looking at the profile and, you know, the trainer doesn't have an awful lot of winners. But um yeah, it was some performance and like there was kind of rumours circulating all over social media and this and that, um, kind of like Johnny was mentioning there. Um, and the whole Carlos thing is really, really bizarre. Uh, like like Johnny mentioned, kind of why was it kind of made such a big deal of in the first place? And it was just kind of, I think it was just kind of the trickling of information that was kind of being passed kind of and that kind of starts rumor, rumors on social media and the Charles Burns kind of official Twitter page then kind of came out and tried to put out an explanation. But I think Charles is saying that, or well, they, they arrived at the races and then I presume that the owner hitched the horse box and took him home before bringing him into the stable yard, which you know, I wouldn't think would be a big deal if the horse was injured or whatever. Um, so yeah, it's just really, really bizarre. Kind of just the way the information was kind of fed to the public. Um, you know, it was kind of not made clear, which I, I think made kind of rumours circulate and, you know, things got a bit hectic and, yeah, it's, but it was it was an exciting Monday, definitely. <laughs> just really, yeah, we'll can, I, can I just say, you're, you're on about if, if Ken Bud's, um, if Ken Bud said to you, you know, you back this horse, whatever, if you look at Ken Bud's jumps horses, we'll say, over the last uh, couple of seasons going into this one, um, so his winner is basically, and if you go back to, um, he would one winner last season, and that horse um, was basically never really backed at all. If you look at his winners um, the previous season, and he's only had a handful of winners, um, the winners he's had, I think the shortest. So he had, like, if you look, go back to the 2021-2022 season, he'd four jumps winners. None of these horses, these are the winners now, none of these horses was ever sent off any sort of a short price. Like, you're talking four to one or bigger, never really a short price. Um, so there's, it's not a gambling yard. Let's let's be clear about no. this. He, this is not he, a gambling yard. This is a horse who's shown a bit of promise. So it's very, very extraordinary for the money to be placed in this horse. Ken Bud's horses are in good form at the moment. He's had a, a flat horse that ran well at Cork and ran well again yesterday. So it's not that his horses are not in, in good form or anything like that. But a gamble of this nature for a Ken Bud's horse is coming completely completely out of the blue yeah well like he'd, he'd won flat winner this year as far as i know drifted from seven to two to seven to one the day it won i don't know what's going on he, he also had a runner which is somewhat interesting he'd a runner started favorite yesterday can't remember the inchiquin something or other started i think it was co-favorite yeah. in it yeah started co-favorite in a race yesterday do you know that horse ran last week and it drifted from six to one to 33 to one in a race that, that's some drift isn't it so I, I don't know what's going on i really don't i never know what this this betting side of things is you see th this is the thing that gets to me every week is you see these horses there was a horse someone gave me a tip for the other day a mick mulvaney horse with gary carroll on it in the last race in avon or something was it on saturday um a horse that had run three times over hurdles recently in the last six weeks or something and shown nothing absolutely zero in three runs it had started at i think odds of about 200 to one each day i got two different people told me on saturday morning that was fancied for a maiden in navin the other day on saturday the last race in navin and if you have a look at it the horse went from a hundred to one i think or 50 to one into 20s in the morning drifted back out to 100 to 1 on the day and no it, it actually ran quite well to be honest which i think there probably is a day in it somewhere um down the line but just whatever happens with these i don't know it seems to be like there's a little bit of word then nothing and they drift away and so on anyway can i, can I, ask, the other can I thing, ask the two of you is the story of anyway good or bad for racing that's well i i think it's 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 basically bad for racing in my opinion that's that's my honest opinion on this i i think if racing in Ireland was run the same way it is in Hong Kong, I think it'd be a completely different sport. I, I think it'd be a much better sport overall. I think people would bet on it the same way they do in the Premier League or whatever else with confidence. You can't do that in this game. You literally can't do it because you don't know what's coming next. Who's pulling a stroke here, there or whatever. And um, that's my opinion on it. I, 
I, I've always had that opinion that people people see you, you look at Charles Barnes. He did, he did treble there on the day, which is which is part of all of this. He he trained three winners um, in down pouting, and people said, "Oh, great, Charles got a, got one over on the bookies." He maybe he did, but he also got one over on the punters. Like it's not as if he 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 rang us all to tell us he's going to have a treble. We don't know is the bottom line. So you're not sure with those gambling yards, such as Charles Barnes, and he can, he can say whatever he is, but there's no doubt there's a there's a gambling element to that yard and horses, um, don't always run absolutely to the top of their game every time they run they seem to be you know run them over wrong trips wrong ground whatever there's lots of other yards doing the same you could you could name a handful of them that do the exact same thing and always have and then it's when they think everything's right they then have a go and they try and win a few quid off the bookies but the problem is for the ordinary punter you can't guess when that's going to be so i me as a punter i don't bet in races where certain trainers have runners because i know i have no chance trying to second guess them it's hard enough trying to pick a winner on your own without having to second guess somebody else along the way as well with it all. So for me, it's not a, it's not a great thing for racing. I know what people like say, to man. see the gambles. Yeah. What do you think, John? You think it adds a bit of spice to it or what do you think? I, I want to get Emma's view, but I, I'm, I've, I've, I've uh, two views on this. One, loads of publicity out of it. Loads of publicity out of the Barney Curley thing. Um, but Barney Curley, for me, was a disgraceful trainer in terms of punters because you had absolutely no idea what they were going to do. And they had Barney Curley writes in his book, brilliant man with his philanthropy, and I like so so much time for the man, all, all he's done for Africa, amazing stuff. But at the same time, Barney in his book has given out about William Hill not laying him a bet and given out about um, <coughs> Sean Graham not laying him a bet in Galway. Are you absolutely kidding me? Your horses, like they've literally two ways of running, hacking up or being absolutely tailed off. In the instance of this, how can you tell a bookmaker? Bookmakers are becoming less and less interested in horse racing. How can you tell a bookmaker that um, you know it should be pricing up races and it should be laying bets in races when you see something like this happening? Because I wouldn't. Why would I lay a bet in that race? I haven't a clue what's going on. Yeah. What do you think, Emma? You have this, what opinion have you gotten? I, to be honest, I, I enjoyed the gambles. Um, like last Monday in Down Patrick, like kind of on a mundane kind of Monday there, it adds awful excitement to kind of, you know, just a very bog standard card up, up in um, Down Patrick. So to be honest, I, I, I think they're kind of part of the game and they kind of go down kind of a history, kind of a mystical kind of thing nearly. I suppose maybe it's maybe it's not right in a way like you were saying, but to me, I think it's just part of the sport and I enjoy it. And, you know, I think in a way, for punters, like I, I back, I started backing Charles's horses when I saw the money coming from them on one day, and look, I, I backed three winners out of it, back one loser, the last horse last. But I mean, it wasn't going too bad, and they were backable prices, all the horses. So the Ken Buds one then as well. Like I mean, look, that's it's just I, I, I to be honest, I enjoy seeing it. I, I, I like, I like the kind of thing about it. It's, look, it's, it's not great for bookmakers and this and that, but um. I just, like Johnny said, it, it kind of brings publicity, whether that's good or bad. But I think an awful lot of people enjoy that kind of aspect to it. I suppose if you're backing against the horses, it's not great. Um, like if, if you want another horse in the race, you fancied it and <laughs> something comes out and gets back from 20s into even money, like you're probably a bit sick then. But yeah, look, I, I enjoy the kind of um, the excitement of it. And, you know, you were, you were kind of watching every race in Down Patrick kind of eagerly to see what would happen. Uh, will, will they keep winning? And there was one one of the winners, um, oh God, the name escapes me now, but kind of in, in running, it looked like they were well beat. And uh, Philip got him up. I don't know how he got him up. Uh, I suppose they went a bit hard in front, but... I was after backing it and like it was just getting exciting as the races went on like you've got two winners you've got three winners last one last but um no, i enjoyed it to be honest like i can't lie i just on that Vinny, like i, I i'm the same like i i think uh it, there's a robin hood element to this like these bookmakers mm -hmm. uh and you see like these bookmakers going off into the American markets and they're making so much money. And like, I, I want people to win off these bookmakers. I want to, I would love to fleece Bet365 or Paddy Power to, for, for a million quid. And I'd love to do it as I'd love to, it'll probably never happen. And I'd love to do it. But the one thing that you can say from Monday is that the IHRB um, has changed tact a little bit in recent years. It's coming down on things like this. It, it feels that it doesn't want um, the wool pulled over its eyes. And as much as Charles, you know, spoke to Conor Fenley, I thought it was a really interesting interview in the Racing Post. And there's a sense of grievance there. I think at this stage with Charles, I mean, the rap sheet isn't great at this stage. So I don't know what he expects. Yeah, yeah. He's, um, I, I thought it was a bit odd, Charles coming out as well and on about this, about <coughs> the CCTV footage and everything from Down Patrick to prove that the non-runner didn't, that the non-runner turned up at the track. Look, 
I, I'm still trying to work out why have the IHRB referred this matter on? There looks to be very little in it, to be honest with you. And then according to Charles as well, in, a, in his recent post interview, he was on about the fact that the IH, IHRB turned up at his stables that night as well to see Carlos, who still hadn't returned home from his trip to uh, down Patrick that day by the time they got there. Now, whether they arrived too early or hadn't whatever gone on, I don't know. I'm sure we'll find out some little bit more. Maybe we will after they've um, they've heard this at the IHRB when they've referred it on. But to be honest, which I can't see anything coming out of either of them. The other thing that gets to me a little bit is the Ken Buds thing. His horse is back from 28 to 1 to even money and sluice is in. Uh, wins eight and a half lengths from a horse who'd won over the same course and distance the previous day and then came out two days later and wins in Town. So the form looks extremely strong. And yet there's nothing ever done about this. That's it. it. Just move on to the next one and there'll be another one this week somewhere along the way. Someone will have a similar punt and they'll land their, they'll land their money as well. And nothing ever happens. It's just, oh, that's it. Yeah, yeah. He mustn't have been trying the first few days and all of a sudden he was trying the last day and away he goes. And that's it, isn't it? That's what gets to me a little bit. But anyway, look. We've talked about it enough because we'll never solve it. Um, we'll move on to another thing from last week, which this this really got me. I couldn't work this out at all. Why, why this happened is the the race apprentice centre in the in uh, Kildare that we know there was an, an issue there about six weeks ago. We were told that there was problems with um, health and safety regarding after an inspection regarding the uh, stable block or, or sorry the accommodation block. One of the two dormitories had problems with its electrics, so. The, all the, there were 20 odd people I think living there they were mainly um, the likes of Wesley Joyce would have been one of them who was in the, uh, who'd come through the uh, the race apprentice course and a lot of them still lived there for a year or two afterwards uh, while they're working in yards around the Curra plus they'd some foreign students there as well and anyway over a weekend it was all um, all hands on deck trying to find alternative accommodation for all of those people because they couldn't stay in the dormitory so horse race in Ireland um came along and said, look, we're going to stick a man in here. We're going to have a look at it and um, see where we go and how we how we fix the problem. So I, I had presumed, obviously naively, um, that the guy they put in, Darren Lawler, he's a good guy. I thought he was going to come in and he'd he'd find some extra funds from somewhere. Or they'd, they'd rejig a few things and they'd get some more money in, do up the dormitories and away we go again. But instead, six weeks later, 21 of the 31 staff have been let go. They've completely ripped the place apart ultimately haven't they um what do you think emmy you've been there you did a story for us um down there last year and everything else you've also done some courses there it's a it's a for me anyway it's a terrific facility it may have been under resourced but it was something that that should be a real strong part of the industry yeah it was really surprising to see kind of the extent of the cutbacks i suppose like when i was down there um I know Paddy was mentioning, Paddy Flood was mentioning that um, like kind of in the last, I don't know, maybe 10 years or so, there's kind of less and less actual jockeys coming out of the course. It's kind of more so like, I think like maybe 90% will go on to become stable staff rather than taking out their apprentice license. But, you know, at the same time, you kind of look through the role of honour um, of the graduates of race. It's kind of crazy to, to think that um, th there's such drastic cutbacks going into it and even kind of most recently I suppose Wesley Joyce I think he was actually living in race up until they closed the dorm rooms um, he went back he was obviously a graduate and he went back I think after his injury and they were helping him along with his re rehabilitation and I think you know it's it's kind of fine to have this kind of elite course um but it's going to be very very hard for the likes of you know a Wesley Joyce who came from not he was like he's not living around Kildare and maybe he wouldn't have ridden an awful lot of pony racing now not 100% sure but like a lot of the kind of top jockeys that would have came out of race kind of would have came from like city backgrounds let's say they wouldn't have ridden a whole pile of horses if any and now they're kind of not really going to get the chance to go to race in the capacity of becoming a jockey in the future because you know, the, the, I think the elite court that's being mentioned will probably be for more so pony racing kind of graduates who probably have kind of a foot into in, into the industry in the first place anyway. So it's it's sad to see um, Johnny Murta had some great quotes on it at his media morning the other day. You know, he was saying without race, there would be no Johnny Murta. And, you know, it's it's just true, really. And it's it's sad, but um, kind of in a way, I suppose something needed to be done just with the way the course has kind of changed over the last few years. But You'd like to you'd like to see um kind of more funding from from the industry and kind of get it back to its past glory. 
yeah, this is the thing. You know, I ask Johnny now in a second, but like the likes of Johnny Murta possibly wouldn't be what he is today, only for the Race Apprentice Centre from doing that course. Wesley Joyce, another one who was taken out of a relatively tough situation in Limerick. Cathy Gannon, another one who came from um, an underprivileged background to some extent, and it gave them all. Uh, a new lease of life gave them gave them a career path and everything else, which has been fantastic for them. We mightn't get a million new jockeys out of it, but surely it's very good for the kids who went there and something that that should be encouraged with all the money that the, that the the industry gets, both in terms of betting, gambling revenue, but also um, through government supports and everything else. Is this not something that should be just properly funded, Johnny? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Like, and um, the. You, you, both of you speak well about it like the, the Wesley situation like he he kind of um if you come from my Ross and Limerick with all due respect you've far less of a chance in life in, on average than you have if you're born in um Dublin 6 or Dublin 16 or anywhere um around where where I actually live now and you have you know if you come from tough inner city backgrounds um there are obstacles ahead of you whether you like it or not Wesley started riding horse when he was three um ironically probably because of actually where he was from but like the the, the situation of getting from there to becoming a really good young young jockey now um was basically made possible through race and um you know some documentaries have been done on it on tv throughout the years and it's it's such a fantastic concept because uh, I've said this a million times, racing needs to get young kids into racing, needs to get them around yards, get them around horses, and race to do that and make, like, Wesley's probably one of the most promising young jockeys around at the moment, um, whereas he could, like, be, have nothing to do with racing because race was there, and we really do need to look at this, and I think Johnny Morton spoke well about it. It's a fantastic idea, um, and it's it's actually quite sad to read what happened to it. Yeah. I agree. Anyway, look, we'll move on again. Um, a couple of other things from last week. Just These are just little things in my own looking at. One of them is 2,000 people turned up for a Gordon Elliott Open Day, which seems absolutely astonishing. That's more than you'd have at nearly any meeting last week, I'd imagine. Um, and one other little thing um, that I'll mention, which is Jennifer O'Donnell, who trained back-to-back -back Irish Greyhound Derby winners, which is astonishing, two dogs from the same litter, um, She's literally from around the corner from Rachel Blackmore. Two of them grew up on the same street almost, well, just around the corner from each other, which is astonishing to think there. There's two women flying the flag for Tipperary in a big way, aren't they? Um, Johnny, did you go to that Greyhound Derby? That'd be one of your things, would it? No, oh, where was I on uh, Saturday? I, I was actually at a League of Ireland match. I, I did work for the... I, I worked at the um, Greyhound Derby for the semi-finals and final last year, but for whatever reason, the Greyhound board didn't use me this year. So um, I, I actually loved the, loved the Derby. But one thing that I was... Um, this For whatever reason this year, I, I've been at the last time I was at the Dogs, it wasn't for the Derby, but I actually love going to the Dogs. But I was talking to bookmakers and um, just going racing last week and... Jesus, Vinny, the betting is alarmingly bad. Like, they were saying right up to the... I don't know how the final went, but they said the semi-final was really, really bad. And how... Like, the Greyhound industry is in serious, in serious problems with the, the betting ring. Like, and I don't know how it's going to fund itself going forward because I think the... I think there would be kind of a... Um, you know, the, the, basically the, the white elephant that was Limerick set the Greyhound um, industry back so much. They sold Harold's Cross for un enormous money, um, I think, to an educational board or whatever. And they're kind of been reeling ever since. And we have that greyhound uh, documentary but the the betting situation is is is, is quite poor um from it but um i don't know how it's going to uh, survive that going forward because they should like the, the betting exchanges have had a massive influence on the on-course ring and so on in racing it has nothing to do with the greyhound uh, betting ring nothing whatsoever yet the money is gone from from it so um i i congratulations to to connections but going forward i don't know what they're going to do with the betting ring because this is shelburne park forget about the country where it's worse again yeah, well, like you see, dog racing is probably its own. Um, it's done, it's done itself no favors here because what happens is that we have a local track here in Newbridge now, and you'd have one bookmaker, possibly two, turning up there. But any of the people involved in the dogs, they can't get on anymore. They know that because they've ripped them off for so long with it that you get, you know, different dog, different day turns up is what it is, isn't it? So that. You know, those bookmakers know it doesn't matter. They can go 10 to 1 your dog and you won't back it, but yet they can go 10s on and you'll be lumping on it at 10s on because you know it can't get beat. So the, the bookmakers can't win, which is why they've gone away. And then the crowds weren't coming as well, which doesn't help either, I suppose. But yet they still get a fair turnout at the likes of Newbridge. I'm sure Shelburne gets a lot now with Harold's Cross. Well. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, oh, it is. It's a great night out, and it's it's hard to believe it's not more successful because there were, there was a time back in whatever it was the nineties into the two thousands when Harold's Cross and Shelburne Park were thriving, and so were a, a lot of the ones around the country as well. When all that funding came in from the government, they they upgraded a lot of the tracks, and you can go for your meal, and you know, in behind the glass, like Dundalk, looking at the looking at the racing every night. It's a, it's a terrific night out, no doubt about it. But um, I I think that it's it's too it's too corrupt the the actual dog racing itself from a from a bookmaking point of view. There's no way in the world you'd want to go and uh, chalk prices up on a board for six dogs. Is there at any at any track in the country? I'd say because you, you you wouldn't last a, a wet week. Um, Emma, what did you think of that the Gordon Elliott thing? Anyway, an open day with two thousand people turning up. Anyway, that's talking about yeah, yeah, it was um, some going. <laughs> yeah, bringing people back racing and in a big way, but they're. Sorry, I'm interrupting you. Yeah. But just like you have to, I think you have to say a fair prayer to Gordon because he actually gave an interview during the week. Um, I can't remember what track it was at now, but he basically kind of was just mentioning his open day and basically said, I think for all these uh, organised open days, you have to register to attend. But he said basically, look, I'm not going to turn anyone away. If you haven't registered, just come on down for the morning anyway. And like that was that was fair play to him like in fairness because the organization that it would take um to have two thousand people at your yard on a saturday morning with all the you know it's just normal work morning i suppose for a lot of the horses um like i guess it's just so good for the sport i think and i just have to say fair, fair play to gordon because it was just so kind of so welcoming the interview i saw it and it kind of makes people kind of feel more part of the sport but it's it's gas like i mean 2000 wouldn't be a bad crowd for most kind of quiet i suppose meetings during the summer um so to get it down to jumps meet or jumps trainer and uh kind of <laughs> an august and august saturday morning was unreal um but i think it kind of just shows the interest that kind of the irish people have in jumps racing kind of in particular they can kind of feel it's kind of maybe a bit more agricultural in a way i suppose and yeah no brilliant um love to see more of it the, the, the thing about Gordon as well, Vinny, yeah. like I was at Down Patrick on uh, Friday, the eve of it, and I'm just trying to think back now. I think he did, Gordon had a treble, I think, and could have had a four timer. Um, and Jack Kennedy rode three of them. Um, but what struck me was that um, Gordon wasn't racing. And I, I was at what Navin um, for a flat meeting during the week, and he, I think he'd one runner, uh, a See the Stars horse. And Gordon, Gordon is, is really, really good at going racing. And I, I, I do wonder with some trainers, like, I think if, if a race course goes out of its way to kind of put on and tries to get people going, if, if trainers just, just don't bother showing up themselves, like, it's not really a great image. And I know you might be very busy, but I think trainers probably should take it a bit more seriously about going racing because i think if you just don't bother showing up for no reason other than that you think your time is better served elsewhere well if the trainer isn't going to go to see the horse what's that saying to the owners what's that saying to race scores and so on and gordon is brilliant at going racing and like in fairness so was willie but gordon like it was i was very very surprised that he wasn't at town patrick and the reason put forward was that he was flat out getting ready for saturday so fair, fair play to gordon yeah, I don't know how they go racing every day. How do you do a job and then go racing? Whatever about doing a job at the races, which I did for about 25 years, so you 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 drive three hours to Sligo and three hours home or whatever, do a job in the middle, but to actually do your day's work and then go for the three hours to Sligo and the three hours home, and then they're never on in the same place two days running, so you're off to Kerry the next day, and then you're back up the north. It's literally non-stop. I, I, I really don't know how they do it. You can see how Willie's always late, but... There you go. That's another story, I suppose. Uh, right, we're going to move on. Big weekend ahead. Biggest weekend of the year, really, in Ireland, I suppose. Um, Champion Stakes weekend, or Champion Festival weekend, whatever they're calling it now. Keep changing the name. But Emma, what do you think? Um, let's look at Saturday. Irish Champion Stakes. We have Augustus Rodan, uh, a flop from the last day in the King George and Queen Elizabeth Stakes in July at Ascot. Um, Jewel Derby winner. Can he bounce back? Uh, yeah, like, I mean, to be honest, it's kind of hard to doubt him too much. Like, we saw Aidan bring him back once after the flop in the Guineas to win the Derby. Brilliant that day. Wasn't quite as impressive in the Irish Derby and then flopped again in the King George. So he's kind of a horse who's had kind of more comeback ones than kind of most you'd remember. But, like, kind of the, the, regard, the regard they hold him in, um, I don't think I'd be backing against him anyway. I'm not sure if I would back him to win it. I think... Um, King of Steel, who he beat at Epson, is actually favourite at the moment. Um, look, he's he's probably been a bit more reliable, I suppose, than Augusto Rodin since the Derby's kind of gone on and won at Ascot. And then he was behind um, Hookham, I think, last time. 
Yeah. But yeah, it's it's a very interesting race. And then you've of course you've Luxembourg thrown in there as well, uh, who's I, I presume an intended runner for Aiden. He won it last year. So it's yeah, it's, it's a weekend I really enjoy. I think it's probably that's probably my favourite one of my favourite races of the, of the whole entire flat um campaign and it's kind of looking like one. It's kind of shaping up to be a really exciting renewal of it. Um, I'd love to see Augusta Road and bounce back, but I wouldn't be totally convinced uh, that, look, it would take some training performance by Aiden, but it's definitely yeah. possible. And um, what about the race itself, Johnny? Just in the sense we've no Mastodaf, we haven't got Paddington, Hookham, Westover. A lot of big names missing, but at the same time, it'll still be a cracking contest. Yeah, like it's unfortunate because I think the first champion stakes I went to was uh, High Chaparral and Falabrav and like that race, I think they had won. I mean, there was vintage Tipple in the race. Was it Alam Shars? Loads of horses. Like it was, and I was absolutely hooked with this race. And fortunately, I wasn't around for like Fantastic Light Galileo or the Giants uh, taking on these horses. I think Fantastic Light and Galileo, there were twenty thousand at it or so that day. When I went to see see the stars, they couldn't get ten. Um, but I, this is my favourite race. Full stop. Uh, I love it. It's three rolls against older horses, milers against mile and a half horses. Phillies against mares, um, Colts against Phillies and mares, um, and so on and so forth. And the, I suppose the problem is, Vinny, like the program is quite, um, the program is quite e expanded. So, so that the likes of Paddington doesn't need to run here. Like I, I don't, I don't think I, I sort of expressed some doubt about Paddington the last day in, in the sense of how much he'd run. And Aidan said that they they spread the elastic too wide, and there was a kind of an inclination for me that he wasn't all that happy that he ran him at all, um, and he was maybe under a little bit of dress to do it. But in any event, what he would bring to this race had he not run the last day, even you know coming in here and um, pretty much unbeaten this season and stepping up um, to take on these horses, taking on August Rodan, and not, I think the way Aidan was talking about like that the lads, as they call them, want to run these horses a lot as they've done with Paddy and August Rodin, they want to run them a lot to see if they're robust enough to make stallions on the basis of their career rather than sort of having them um, half-baked going to stud and then finding out that their horses aren't very um, robust. Uh, so I think they, Aiden would have happily run Paddington against August Rodin here. Um, and we've seen in recent years he's run very good horse against each other in this race, but that's not going to happen. Luxembourg, for me, he's a good horse. He won the race last year, but he's no real star. Um, so the, the betting for me is a bit odd here. We're still going to have the derby first and second. How can Paddy Power be 11 to 8, a King of Steel, and 9 to 2, August Rodan, when August Rodan will beat him if he runs to the derby form? I think maybe King of Steel dropping back in triple hell. But for me, I'd fancy August Rodan. Aiden said he was ready to explode, was it, last week? I wasn't at, at Aiden's last week, but he seems very happy with him. Um, so I'm happy to take the 9 to 2, which is available uh, right now. Aiden told me to back him at similar odds ahead of the derby. Um, I think it's going to be an interesting race. And tactically as well. I don't think Bally Doyle is running anything else, um, so it'll have two legitimate contenders. I love this race, and I haven't mentioned as well, this is the last time to see Frankie de Tori at Leopardstown, so I hope Leopardstown, if they have any sense, they'll really big up the Frankie factor, because um, it'll actually draw a crowd. It will bring people to see Frankie potentially win the race. Um, the last time you'll ever see him at Leopardstown as a jockey, I presume. Um, so this is, I love this weekend, I have to say. I hope they turn up at the Cora as well, and uh, I can't wait for it. Last time you'll see Frankie at Leprechaun this year. That's what that is, I think. Um, because he could well be back next year, the year after. We reckon. Don't know yet. I think he went. I think something will draw him back at some stage. It, it won't be the last time you see him in a saddle, I'd imagine. Um, that's just my own personal view of it. Uh, looking ahead, then the other one on Saturday is the Matron Stakes. Got a very nice filly here, Tahira. Uh, one thousand guineas winner, Coronation Stakes winner. Emma, is this a penalty kick? Uh. I wouldn't maybe not say a penalty kick. She's coming off a bit of a break, but like she's definitely a really exciting filly. Um, beaten in the English guineas by a good mare, but she's kind of progressed and progressed since. Uh, yeah, look, I think she's kind of one that will. She's kind of one of the stars of the of the flat season, I suppose, in a way. And yeah, I'd I'd be surprised to see her beat. To be honest, I think she's a very very good mare and. She's probably one of the ones you'd be kind of most excited looking looking um, for at the weekend. But as Johnny mentioned there, the Frankie factor is going to be massive at Leopardstown at the weekend. Like I know someone who um, actually arranged a whole trip to the Irish Derby just because her grandson was so in love with Frankie Latore. He wanted to see Frankie. Unfortunately, Frankie wasn't riding that day. But I think, yeah, you, can, you can't underestimate the crowd that Frankie Latore will draw. And uh, I, ho I hope... Um, Hope the weather stays nice and I hope they come out to see Frankie because uh, like the look through the races like it's it's as good as you'll get for a weekend of flat racing 
and just that Frank Dettori factor is going to add, add to it, hopefully. Yeah, loads of great racing this weekend. We've got some racing Sunday as well when we look at the Curra. Uh, one of them, the Ledger. We've got Kiprios coming back. Uh, first run on the track for almost a year. Won the Prix de Cadran, also won this race last year. Just looking at that, Johnny, we've got the, the season for these top flat horses is way longer than anything the jumps horses see, isn't it? Because you, you've got some of them coming out as early as March, end of March into April, and then they're still running, going off to Breeders' Cups and um, races in Hong Kong and wherever else, and Japan Cups towards the end of the year as well. So it's a very long season, and Melbourne Cups as well. So how do you how do you reckon on that? Kiprios coming out this late in the season. I can't remember a horse coming out this late in previous years anyway into September. It's hard to know, Vinny. Like, I mean, he's three to one now. If 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 you were, um, that would be one of the greatest bets of all time, really. I think if if you could trust his his well being, um, and but I again, as I said, I wasn't at the the yard, but just reading between the lines, it was hard to be confident the way Aiden was talking about the horse. He was like, okay, well, you know, it's it's great to have him back, but there were a lot of sort of provisos and caveats, um, so like. It's hard to imagine the mar- I think the market on the day is going to get this pretty much right. And as much as it's kind of a it's kind of a classic, and it isn't. Um, I think this is a this is our Gold Cup, really, the Irish Ledger. We don't have that two and a half mile race, but this this race, the you know the greats that Dermot Well has had in the race, and you know the the likes of Yates running in it. And I think Search for a Song in recent years, Kiprios is going to become that great stayer. And I really hope he shows up anyway because it's a great kind of talking point on the day. And I'd love to see him come back next year because I still think he is the top dog in the same division and he's the sort of horse that's hard to get the bottom of him and um, because of uh, the sort of the way he races I think he just kind of wins by enough but it'll be some effort from Aiden I mean I don't train horse but I imagine considering we haven't seen him since the Prix de ran, the fact that he's now um, coming back in which is not going to be a bad renewal of the race either there'll be some performance but between that and um, and you know the good two-year-old races on the day it's it's going to be a uh, it's going to be a hell of a Sunday. I, just on to hear, I'd love to I'd love to have seen her in the champion stakes, stepping up to a mile and two for the first time, but we can't have it all. No, just looking at Aidan, as you say, he, between champion stakes, ledger, national stakes, my glare, and the national stakes were due to see City of Troy, which has been most impressive in two wins, one that's superlative stakes in Newmarket by six and a half lengths. The runner-up and down and won a group two after that as well. And then you've got Yalang Yalang of Aidan's unbeaten daughter, Frankel, in the my glare. Emma, he could he could win half a dozen races or more this weekend, could he, Aiden? Yeah, I, I I think I'm kind of surprised how sure City of Troy is for the national stakes. Like I don't think Buccaneer Forty has done a whole pile wrong this season. Very very impressive at the Cora last time, um, in the Group One and had won the Railway Stakes at the Cora as well. So I think there's kind of real competition there. So I'm kind of surprised that City of Troy is odds on. Look. Looks a very, very good horse at Newmarket last time. You can't knock him at all. But I just think it kind of speaks to you know the quality of horses in all of the races. Like, look through the two-year-old races. I mean, you could make a case for an awful lot of them. A lot of them kind of very exciting. Maybe they haven't won too many times. But, yeah, look oh, how many races Aidan O'Brien will win. It's kind of, I suppose he has kind of most of the the top horses in a lot of the races but I'm, I'm really looking forward to the flying five as well uh high fail princess kind of added a great atmosphere to it last year when she was winning it um coming kind of coming into it in a different kind of profile this year she's been beaten a few times whereas last year she kind of was stacking up the ones beside her name before coming over but um her and brad so kind of were beaten in uh york by the horse you mentioned last week but whatever yeah Live, live with the dream, yeah, yeah, but yeah. kind of got the one of the race that day, so I think she, she's kind of one I'm looking forward to seeing as well, and um, be great to see her getting the win for John Quinn back in his home country. I, I know, Vinny, we don't like, um, in Cheltenham, like, you know, we, we give out about them dividing up the race and all that, and if you look at the national stakes, like, if they if they didn't have that race on the Saturday, the I think, which, what is it, a group two that August Rodan won last year, you could say, well, these horses might run against each other, but I don't know does Aiden necessarily want to be running his top two-year-olds against each other at this stage. And you look at, like, you mentioned Ilang Ilang, who's by Frankel, cost a lot of money. Diego Velasquez cost 2.4 million guineas as a yearling. And he is a half, pretty much a three-parts brother to Broome and Point Longsdale, who are two extremely good horses. Basically the best that Australia has produced. Now, with all due respect to Australia, um, he's basically like a 
a, a League One stallion compared to Frankel. And Frankel is the stallion of Diego Velasquez. And as much as you talk about City of Troy, Diego Velasquez on his debut was sent off two to five in a 13 runner maiden at the Curra. I think first time out, City of Troy was sent off six to four in a 13 runner maiden at the Curra. So I'm not necessarily sure Diego Velasquez is that far down the pecking order. Now, you can back him at 12 to one for uh, the Vincent Roy National Stakes, but I imagine he'd probably go. For the race of the Ghost Rodan, and if you won on the uh, Saturday at Leopardstown, the ty- I, I forget the name of it, but if you want to back him for the Derby, I would suggest you back him now. Wow, that's big, big talk, big talk. Diego Velasco, looking forward to seeing that. And Emma, now you were down in Johnny Murtis last Thursday um, doing a video for us, which is you can also see on this channel. Johnny, has he gonna, is he going to have a winner over the weekend? He targets all these big meetings, doesn't he? But he hasn't had he hasn't had the greatest success, but he certainly didn't in Royal Ascot and a couple of other ones this season. He sent that um, Ladies' Church, is it over for the Nuntorp? Wasn't, wasn't mapped. That's in the Flying Five, I see, in the entries, whether it runs or not, I don't know. Yeah, um, yeah Ladies' Church should be... Sorry. sorry, Emma, yeah, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead, Johnny, sorry. Yeah, briefly, I don't know if you said, sorry, Vinny, I, I thought you said me there, but Ladies' Church is a, word, oh, okay. is a very rare church. Very rare Churchill in the sense that, you know, I was actually, that, that Chelten, I was at a, a preview night for a, sort of the Corinthian Challenge um, that was organised um, last weekend in Kildare and Shane Foley was there and I was just reflecting on all these Churchills that, it, that, that Jessica Harrington has had and the likes of Yashin who could show up um, at the weekend and they're all big kind of middle distance horses and then in the middle of it all you get ladies, Church is basically a five furlong sprinter and um, is quite quite reliant on nice ground and might have a chance for Johnny. I'm just trying to get the horse up here that I wasn't at the, the Morta morning, but and, and Emil relate the, the stable preview, but I think the horse he probably liked most from the weekend um, was the horse that is running in the handicap later on, who I have here. One, two, three, uh, four, five. Dark Angel horse that won at Nace. The last day uh, is Take Heart, who's gone up a little bit in the weights but I think that's the horse he's most looking forward to and I'd love if Johnny had a winner I think he's really doing well as a trainer um, and maybe Emma can furnish that horse only got six pounds for the last day yes. over to you Emma tell us about Johnny Murphy <laughs> yeah he, he, he mentioned this weekend. he mentioned take heart as one of his best chances of the weekend in fairness um but yeah he's got he's got kind of a small ish but kind of select enough team I suppose he had the one two three in that uh, Northfield handicap last year um, I think that was his only winner of the of the weekend. But look, it's very very hard for kind of a trainer without maybe the support of like someone like Coolmore or Godolphin to a, a big extent to kind of compete on these days. Like when you look through some of the pedigrees and the races, but I think Johnny's done fairly well um, at the meeting. Like he's won the Ledger, he's won the Matron, had the one two three last year, and he's got you know some some chances going. Um, I think that probably the handicaps will probably be his best his best uh, shot at it. But yeah, no, it was a great morning. Johnny's um Johnny's brilliant to listen to. I, like he's very, very enjoyable to hear him talk about racing. His opinions on kind of most subjects he was asked about were really interesting and yeah, I think the video is definitely worth the watch. Um he kind of goes through all his uh goes through all his kind of intended runners and picks out his kind of best chances as well. So yeah, no, isn't it's it, a great isn't morning. Isn't it a bit odd at that um cool more haven't more or some other big owners haven't sent him horses because like there's obviously such a connection there and i remember this a few years ago now when he was starting off i can't remember what the night was but he was on the panel anyway and i said what are you charging per month and he said 60 quid a day for to train a horse i was like you're, you're starting off as a trainer at 60 quid a day and he said i'm going to do everything the best i can i came from bally doyle i'm going to do everything right and i'd love to see him i would love to see him with a very very good two-year-old he's got a yeah, lot of horses, it's actually man. interesting I asked him what um, race he'd most like to win as a trainer, and I was kind of just expecting him to say the Derby. It's kind of what everyone says, I suppose. But he said he'd love to have a miler to go to the campaign of the Guineas, and that was kind of what he wanted most. But yeah, it's it's surprising maybe Kumar having support him, but he's getting support from Naga Khan, I suppose, who we had massive connection with riding as well. So yeah, look, he's kind of someone you'd love to see with with a big horse, like you mentioned, because you know he's kind of such a likable character as well, I suppose. Yeah, but it's a very big string, isn't it? He's, he he must be the biggest trainer on the curve at this stage. I think he's there. There's no one. I, I wouldn't say Dermot Well has as many horses as Johnny Murta um, or anyone else around is, here. Right? Yeah, yeah. No, he's done fantastic in a short space of time. But look, he's a, he's a terrific character and he was some jockey back in the day as well. Um, I presume he still rides work, does he, Emma? 
I don't I don't think so. Um, maybe mm. the odd time, but I think most of the time he's on the ground, I suppose. It's it's strange. A lot, a lot of the kind of ex-jockeys that go training, maybe they ride out for a bit, but I think most of them kind of say they want to see it from the ground. I suppose everyone has their own methods, but I think the likes of Joseph or Ryan, like I, don't, I think they ride very regu- very rarely. I'm sorry, but... um. I think yeah, you ride, Joseph might ride on a Sunday, kind of just keep, but you can't, yeah. it's like a, it's like a player manager. You can't be riding work on the seven horse behind you. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's like, it's like you saying about them training and then going racing every day. I don't think you can necessarily do that either. It's, it's, mm. it's look, it wear you out in the end, but particularly one of those big yards mm. where they're having runners seven days a week at about 14 different tracks. So anyway, look, we've had a good chat about it all. Have you got a winner for either or for us, either of you? Uh, for the weekend, do you think? Emma, I'll put you on the spot first. Anything you think oh, will definitely gosh. win? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm going to go with Broccanero Forte. I, I, I really like him. And I think he's probably still a little bit underrated, even though he is, um, he's kind of proven his class, I think, in everyone so far. He could be a bit of value against um, the short one in that. And what about you, Johnny? Um. I'd like to back that uh, the horse, of Frankel horse I mentioned. I think I, I just I just love love everything about his Derby win and his pedigree. I'd, I'd back him for the Derby I'd, for the weekend at nine two. I'll back against Rodan. Um, I'm willing to. I, I can't really make head or tail of his sort of. Um, I guess his bipolar type form. It's either one extreme or the other. Um, but he's I. I just the way Aidan was talking, and I think the makeup of the race, the the track at Leopardstown, the mile and two. Um, I think I think there's a nice kind of makeup for him there, and so there are two horses: one long term, one for Saturday. A horse that I'm just going to tip from the weekend's action is actually Cholita. Um, Sarah Lynham's had very few runners this uh, summer, and she's been doing well with the string that she's had at Dundalk in recent years. I tipped up Cholita um, at Navin on on Saturday. He's had three runs now in, she's had three runs rather in sprints um, and I just thought she was eye-catching again in the headgear. Never really sort of put into the race but surely one stepping up and trip on soft ground and I'm going to back her the next day. She's a dragon pulse out of Listen Alexander uh, no less. 35 grand yearling out of a uh, good five furlong winner Listen Alexander. So um, Cholita next time under uh, Ben Cohn would be one to keep an eye on uh, though she won't be running Champions Weekend. Very good. For me it'll probably be Highfield Princess in the uh, the Flying Five, I think she's probably too good for them, to be honest with you, if she brings her A game over again. Uh, anyway, look, thanks for watching. Thanks for contrib- contributing to it, guys. And we'll see you all again next week when we'll have a look back and see what didn't win and what did win over Champions Weekend. All right, thanks for watching. Bye for now. <laughs>